Hello, and welcome to another one of these things. Today we're going to be talking about Koji Suzuki's 1998 novel, Spiral. Glenn Wally was listed as the only translator on my copy of the book. I don't know what happened to Robert. I hope he's doing okay. Spiral is the sequel to the 1991 novel, Ring, which I covered in an earlier video. You should go watch that one if you haven't. This one will make more sense then. Okay, so just so you know what we're dealing with, here are some quotes from professionals that they put on the back of the book. Spiral sinister events will linger in the reader's mind from USA Today, which they're not wrong. The, en <laughs> the ending of this book does live in my mind rent free. And here's one from the Onion AV Club. Spiral is a modern ghost story with a boo at the end that trumps its predecessors in scale. Which I just think is a very silly thing to write, and I wanted to share it with you all. As you might recall from my last video, Spiral was adapted into film in 1998, but was not very well received. Probably because the story it's adapting isn't very good. I still haven't gotten to see Spiral the movie, so I can't bring up comparisons to the movie like I was able to in the last video. But if you know where I can find it, please in the comments tell me. I desperately need to see this movie. As the sequel, Spiral is bigger, badder, wetter. It has everything. Characters I don't immediately hate. A plot that goes further off the rails than Ring could have ever dreamed. Content warnings that I don't really know how to categorize. All I can tell you is that this book, and by extension my video, deals with uncomfortable subject matter and may not be suitable for all audiences. It deals with the aftermath of losing a child, some suicidal thoughts and self-harm, pregnancies that go all the way bad, and fucking Ryuji's in it again. How, you ask? Didn't he die in the last book? We'll get there. I promise. This is a journey. We open with a prologue introducing us to our new main character. That's right. Asakawa is not the protagonist anymore. Mitsuo Ando is the new model and he is a straight upgrade. Seven pages in, and I already care way more about him and his plight than I ever did about that shithead Asakawa. And I will get to the book eventually. But isn't it weird that the narration refers to Ando and Asakawa by their last names, but in Ring, Ryuji was always referred to by his first name? That's something that I just thought about, and it's kind of weird, isn't it? My limited understanding of Japanese culture is that it's pretty normal to call people by their last names unless they're a close friend. Which, since Ring was mostly written from Asakawa's perspective, makes sense that Ryuji would be referred to by his first name, because they've been BFFs ever since Ryuji confessed to Asakawa about the literal crimes he committed, or lied to Asakawa about those literal crimes and pretended to commit them for some reason, depending on who you ask. But in the one chapter that was written from Ryuji's perspective, he definitely called Asakawa by his last name, but the narration in that chapter still used Ryuji instead of Takayama. And is it normal in Japanese literature to refer to the protagonist in the third person by their first or last name? I don't actually know. All of the other books I've read that have been translated were written in the first person, and the only copy of a book that I have handy in Japanese is my copy of Maho no Takubin, which was written in the third person, it seems, but Kiki's name is written in katakana, and I have no way of knowing if that's typical or not. And I'm getting way out into the weeds on this, but that is weird, right? Sort of like Suzuki, or maybe Glenn, I'm not sure, wanted to create distance between us and Ando or Asakawa, but wanted us to be closer to Ryuji? I may be totally off base with that one, and anyone who knows better than me, please, like, tell me in the comments. So, the book. The prologue starts with Ando dreaming of the ocean. He's searching for something, but can't find it. We find out pretty quickly that the thing he's searching for is his son, Takenori, who was swept away by a wave while they were swimming together and drowned. Ando is woken by a phone call from his wife, who demands that he sends the divorce paper she sent to him and also yells at him for letting their son die. Ando hangs up, signs the papers, and lays down to cry. He then decides that he really does need to get ready for work, and stops while shaving to imagine dissecting himself. Ando spent his days cutting corpses open, so he knew perfectly well what he'd find inside his chest, 
His fist-sized heart sat cradled between two pink lungs and was beating firmly. If he concentrated, he could almost hear it. But that persistent pain in his chest, where in his innards did sorrow lodge? Was it the heart? He wanted, with his bare hands, to scoop out the clump of remorse. So this is going to be a cheerful book. Okay, but for real? This is a pretty heavy opening. I really feel for Ando. He's going through one of the most terrible things I can imagine. Not only losing his child, but the body was never even found. The only physical way he has to remember his son is a couple of hairs that have gotten tangled around his wedding band. Both of the books in the series so far have had really strong openings. And it's a shame because I know that it's not going to be maintaining this level of energy for the rest of the book. So part one is called Dissecting, and it opens with Ando going to work. To be perfectly honest, I'm not really clear on what Ando's job actually is. The narration mentions that he's a lecturer at the university, but also he has to take turns working in the coroner's office. I don't know enough about medical schools to know if that's how that works or not. At least, I assume he works at a medical school. But he mentions that both Ryuji and his ex-wife also went to the school he works at as students, and... And they went to school for philosophy and liberal arts, respectively. So I just don't understand what kind of school this is, I guess. Anyway, the body Ando needs to examine is Ryuji's. Shockingly, this book doesn't take the time to pause and remind us all what a wild coincidence this is, like it did last time. It turns out that Ando and Ryuji knew each other back when they were in college. Ryuji was a medical student back before he decided to go get a philosophy degree instead. And don't you worry, Ando makes very sure to inform us what an amazing and special boy Ryuji is. Most graduates of their program were aspiring clinicians, and when Ando decided to go into forensic medicine, people called him an oddball behind his back. But Takayama had gone even further off track. He'd led his class at med school, but after graduation he'd started over as an undergraduate in the Department of Philosophy. At the time of his death, he'd been a lecturer in philosophy, specializing in logic. In other words, even granting that the school had let Takayama re-enroll as a junior, his rise in the department had been meteoric. And this is one of the bigger problems that I have with Suzuki's writing. He cannot stop sucking Ryuji's dick. It was kind of frustrating back in Ring when he was carrying the story along and solving all of the mysteries, but it gets so, so much worse in this book. Don't even get me started on loop. It's... We'll get there when we get there, but, um... Oh boy. Anyway, this chapter has another example of a thing about Suzuki's writing that is just fucking awful. Mai's here! And the narration wastes no time in being creepy about her either. Mai, dressed in a plain navy dress, had a white handkerchief clutched in her hands. Ando wondered if proximity to death brought out a woman's beauty. I mean, come the fuck on. I was trying to be generous back in Ring, since all of the chapters where Mai appeared were written from Asakawa's perspective, and I could just say that it was just Asakawa being a weird creep, and not, uh, you know, Suzuki writing in this one female character who has basically no screen time unless she's being objectified by the man around her and has no spoken lines that don't revolve around the man she's attached to. At least Ando's not picturing her wet and naked. Her face was a perfect oval in shape, with smooth, balanced features. Ando could see the beautiful curve in her skull without dissecting her. No doubt, beneath her skin, her organs had a healthy hue, and her skeletal frame was perfectly regular. He had a sudden urge to touch them. Hey, Ando? What the fuck does that mean? Because Ryuji's cause of death was so mysterious, the police are still investigating, but can't find any reason to suspect that it might have been murder. Mai gives a basic rundown of Ryuji's death from her perspective, and Ando briefly entertains the idea that she might have killed him somehow, but quickly decides that it probably didn't happen that way because her grief reminds him of his own. Ando is informed that it's time to start the autopsy, and Ando goes in thinking about how he's definitely going to be able to find the cause of death, while the narration suggests that he might not be able to. Chapter 2. Ando goes into the autopsy room, which is very wet. And apparently they like it that way because the sink is kept running the entire autopsy. 
I don't know enough about how autopsies work in a Japanese autopsy room to say for certain that this is a wild thing that's happening, but somehow I just didn't expect it to be so wet in there. Anyway, Ando goes over to the body and takes some time to examine Ryuji's penis and comment to himself about how small it is and that Ryuji and Mai have probably never fucked because Ryuji has a micro penis. I don't know why that was necessary, Ando. <laughs> Do you think that was what the cause of death was? Small dick-itis? To be clear, I do remember liking Ando a lot more than Asakawa when I was reading this book the first time. But now I'm starting to wonder why. Ando eventually stops laughing at Ryuji's tiny penis and actually does his job. He opens him up and starts removing organs. From the heart, he can tell that Ryuji died from a heart attack. One of the assistants notices a strange ulcer in Ryuji's throat, and Ando cuts it out for samples while noting that he hasn't seen an ulcer like this one before. Also, back to the names thing. In the last chapter, Ryuji was called by his last name, but now that he's being dissected, he's being called by his first name again by the narration. Maybe to show how much closer Ando is to him emotionally now that he's seen his dick and cut out his heart, which is how I make all of my friends. As Ando removes Ryuji's brain, he remembers how when they were in medical school together, his whole class would take turns creating codes and puzzles for the others to solve. And because Ryuji is such a super smart mega genius, he was always the first one to solve them, and nobody could solve his puzzles until one day Ando solved his puzzle, but Ando was just like, no, I just got lucky, I just happened to see a thing that made me think of the right answer. Which, as far as I can tell, is basically just how Ryuji lived his whole life, so... Back in those days, Ando had felt something akin to envy towards Ryuji. Several times he'd felt his self-confidence crumble under the burden of knowing that he'd never dominate Ryuji, that he'd always be under Ryuji's sway. Do you see what I mean about Suzuki not being able to stop sucking Ryuji's micropenis? So Ando finishes examining slash being jealous of Ryuji's big smart brain and they start stuffing his empty chest cavity full of newspapers, you know, so his body doesn't collapse in on itself, like an old jack-o'-lantern. Stripped of its internal organs, the body looks skinnier. You've lost weight, Ryuji. Ando couldn't figure out why he'd address the corpse in his head like that. Usually he didn't. Was there something about Ryuji's cadaver that made him want to talk to it? Or was it simply because he'd known the guy? So Ando starts feeling weird about talking to Ryuji in his head because of ghost magic, I guess. His stomach starts to itch, and when it doesn't go away, he checks Ryuji's body, and there's a scrap of newspaper sticking out right where he had the itch on his body, and on the newspaper is a sequence of numbers. So he memorizes the numbers on the paper, thinking they're important, and suddenly is overcome with the sense that Ryuji isn't really dead, even though he held several of Ryuji's vital organs in his hands. And then he's like, I have to pee. And then he imagines Ryuji's corpse walking around, and then he's like, now I really have to pee. And the chapter ends. Chapter 3. Ando goes out for lunch and is grumpy and paranoid because he's so spooked by Ryuji's body or something. While he's eating, he keeps thinking about Ryuji's testicles and the fact that they were about the size of quail eggs, and also there's quail eggs in his lunch. When he's not obsessing over Ryuji's testicles, he's thinking about the numbers he saw in the paper that was stuffed in Ryuji's stomach. He eventually thinks that they might be some sort of code and begins trying to solve it. The code spelled out the word ring, and Ando, who didn't read the first book, is like, like a bell or a telephone? And then he starts thinking about this time when he was a kid, he was staying with his grandmother while his parents were having, like, a date night or something. The town had this special bell that was used to alert anyone when a fire broke out, but he was too young to really know that, so he just knew that there was a big scary noise, and then exactly one year later his father died, and thinking about this puts him off his food. Ando thinks about how Ryuji will probably be cremated later that night, and now he thinks that Ryuji might still be alive in some way and trying to send him a message. Chapter 4 It's a few days later and Ando is meeting with Mai in the park. Mai called him and mentioned that she discovered something that might have something to do with why Ryuji died, and Ando is like, information from a pretty girl? Heck yeah! and agrees to meet with her. Since he works in the same campus that he used to attend during his own college years, Ando briefly reminisces about how he used to meet his ex-wife under the ginkgo trees when they were students, 
He notices Mai reading a book and doesn't want to startle her, so he accosted her with intentionally loud footsteps and she raised her head, which has to be the weirdest possible way to phrase that, right? Like, accosted is not the verb I would have chosen for that sentence. Anyway, he sits down and Maya's like, have the results come back? And he's like, maybe we should do this over tea. So they go to a cafe and I'm not sure why they couldn't have just met there, or, but whatever. My orders a fruit parfait, which surprises the hell out of Ando for no discernible reason, and then Ando makes the whole thing weird. Er. I love fruit, she shrugged after the waitress left. For a moment, Ando thought she said, I would love you, and kicked himself for indulging in such a ridiculous fantasy. A man of your age. It was truly a gorgeous fruit parfait, nestled on wafers and topped with a cherry. From the way she tore into it, it was clear that Mai was partial to this shop's confections. She had the same kind of intent look that Takenori used to wear when he was eating something he loved. It just about broke Ando's heart. So there's a lot to unpack here, but I think it's best we just walk past it for now. Ando goes on to complain about how his wife was always on a diet, and was also always a bit on the chubby side until Takenori died, and that she dropped a frightening amount of weight, so much so that Ando had trouble even looking at her. But that all gets cut off when Ando decides to continue being weird and lustful at Mai, who is honestly just trying to eat her parfait, let the girl live her life in peace. When she's done eating, she asks about the tests they're running on Ryuji's corpse, and Ando's like, weird to be doing this after watching you eat that parfait, but sure. And he starts by explaining what a tissue sample is, because one time he got into an argument with a relative of a different dead person who didn't understand what they were, and was extremely worried about what they were doing to his dead relative's corpse in there. I mean, Ando was probably just laughing at the dude's dick, don't worry about it. Anyway, Ando explains tissue samples to Mai like she's a child. I know he's just being thorough because she's a layperson, but it comes off as really condescending when he talks about it for some reason. So Mai brings up the fact that Asakawa called while she was sorting through Ryuji's stuff, and he mentioned a videotape, and she's like, I'm not a medical expert, so I have to ask, could he have seen something on that videotape that scared him so badly he died? And Ando's like, that sounds unlikely. So he's like, I should probably contact this Asakawa person to find out more about the tape, because he didn't read the first book, and Maya's like, yeah, he writes for a newspaper. And Ando writes down his name and is surprised that he just knows what character Sasakawa spells his name with without having to ask. Chapter 5 So Ando cheerfully starts the chapter off with some sake and informing us that he hasn't had a drink since his son died because he's worried that if he does drink, he'll drink too much and decide to kill himself. But he's chill this time, so it's fine. He heads to his apartment and gets a phone call from his friend Miyashita. Miyashita reminds him to RSVP for a co-worker's farewell party, but he's like, mm, I have somewhere else to be, because he asked Mai out after they finished up at the cafe, and Miyashita's like, dude, you gotta come. And they go back and forth like this until Miyashita's like, ooh, is it because you got a girlfriend? And Ando is stunned that Miyashita managed to guess that he had a date, and Miyashita tells Ando to just invite Mai along. But Ando's like, we're not really at an invite-to-work party's place in our relationship, and Miyashita's like, okay, fine, don't come. But I'm telling literally everyone I know that you're on a date with your new girlfriend. Miyashita laughed, and Ando knew he wouldn't be able to get mad at the guy. The only comfort Ando had been afforded during the gut-wrenching days after his son had died and his wife had left him had come from a present Miyashita had given him. Miyashita hadn't told him to cheer up or anything meaningless of that sort. Instead, he'd given Ando a novel saying, Read this. It was the first Ando had heard of his friend's interest in literature. He also discovered for the first time that books could genuinely give strength. The novel was sort of a building's roman the story of an emotionally and physically scarred youth who learns to overcome his past. The book still held an honored place on Ando's bookshelf. So this is actually a really sweet moment, and I'm instantly on board for this story again. Like, it's so refreshing after dealing with Ryuji and Asakawa for the entire previous book. Look at these two people, acting like they actually like each other and support each other, and acting like human beings do. That's not to say that a story focusing on a dysfunctional friendship like in Ring is a bad story. I think that might have been what Suzuki was going for with Ryuji and Asakawa, but you need to have a reason to care about 
either of the characters involved in said friendship. I mean, Asakawa was a shitty dude, but like, not in an entertaining way. He wasn't like witty or funny. He didn't do entertaining things that were fun to watch. He was just this bland nothing of a dude who did inexplicably awful things in a really boring way and was just rude to his wife. Asakawa wasn't a compelling character so much as he was the viewpoint from which we got to view the interesting bit of the story. That is, the mystery of what happened to these four teens and eventually what happened to Sadako. Even though he really didn't contribute much to that part of the story and mostly served as a camera for all the big smart thinking Ryuji was doing. And Ryuji, the real main character, comes screaming into the story and not only positions himself as totally unlikable, but actively drags Asakawa down with him by association. He isn't even shitty in a fun way either. I think there might have been an attempt to give him a personality of some kind, but he just comes off mostly as an edgy 14-year-old who just discovered nihilism. As a result, their adventure... no... journey? Their long string of conversations is only interesting when it's focusing on characters who aren't them, like Sadako and Shizuko's backstories. I think that Spiral succeeds where Ring failed. Sure, Ando is weird as hell. I wouldn't want to be friends with him in real life, but I don't actively detest reading about him the way I did Asakawa or Ryuji. And Miyashita is just a nice dude who wants to help his friend. I really do want Ando to grow and change as a person and maybe move past the grief that's destroying his life. And also not be killed by the ghost of smallpox. Speaking of which, Ando asks Miyashita if the test on Ryuji's tissue samples turned back anything interesting. And Miyashita's like, oh yeah, they're basically not paying attention to the arterial blockage at all. It's all about the sore you found in the throat. He took one look at it with his naked eye, and what do you think the old man said it looked like? Knock it off and just tell me. All right, all right, I'll tell you. He said it looks like what you can see on smallpox victims. Ando thinks that smallpox is probably an unlikely cause of death, but Miyashita scolds him for dismissing the more experienced text statements out of hand. And then Ando thinks more about what he knows about smallpox, which is not a lot because he specialized in forensics and not diseases, and he's like it takes seven days for the symptom to reach their peak, which... I did a little googling, and that just doesn't seem right. But this is fiction, so I can suspend my disbelief. Listen, this is so stupid I don't even want to say it. Did you know there's a strain of smallpox that produces obstructions in blood vessels with a near 100% mortality rate? Ando shook his head ever so slightly. No? Well, there is. Don't tell me that's what caused Ryuji's arterial blockage. Fine, then. I won't. But listen, that sarcoma he had on, on the interior wall of his artery. What was that? You looked at it under magnification. I love that Miyashita is like, I know this is dumb, but this is the plot we've been given. Even though this explanation seems really strange to me. I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know if that sort of thing about the smallpox that causes heart attacks is true or not. That sounds terrifying. But if we go back to that chapter of Sadako backstory, it seems pretty clear that she just had the ability to induce heart attacks as one of her psychic powers. And I guess I just kind of assumed that was why people who were cursed by her died from heart attacks? But if that's not the case, then what was the point of adding that detail? I know the series has a serious case of the retcons, we'll see that more clearly in loop, but this change just seems so random and pointless. Ando and Miyashita decide that if it was smallpox, then there would likely be other victims, so Miyashita agrees to look into it and see if they can track down victims in other hospitals who have similar symptoms. They get off the phone and Ando begins to drink. He ends up thinking about the day before Takanori died and how he dreamed of the ocean, almost like he had a premonition and now he's having another one. He thinks Ryuji is trying to tell him something from beyond the grave and eventually realizes that he's sitting in the same position Ryuji had been when he died, so he decides to stop doing that and go to bed. Chapter 6 Ando heads to meet Miyashita to find out what he learned since they last spoke. Miyashita is reading an astrology book, and when Ando enters the office, he tries to get Ando to tell him what his sign is. Ando ignores him and insists that they focus on the potential smallpox outbreak, and Miyashita tells him about the six cases that he's learned about, not including Ryuji's four teens and a mother and child. That's right! We're learning what happened to Shizu and Yoko after the events of Ring, and it's... not good. 
Despite presumably breaking the curse, Shizu and Yoko passed away quietly in the car as Asakawa was driving them home. Asakawa then got into a car accident, presumably distracted by his wife and daughter dying in the backseat of his car, and is now laying catatonic in a hospital bed. And Ando is like, hang on, Hazuyuki Asakawa was Ryuji's friend and visited him shortly before he died. And then they're both like, oh fuck, maybe there is an outbreak coming. Ando decides that he needs to talk to the person who conducted the autopsies on Yoko and Chizu, and instead of calling him on the phone, he decides to just go over and meet with him in person. Chapter 7. Ando goes to the other hospital to speak to the doctors there. He discovers that the cause of death was exactly the same as Ryuji's and wonders how it's possible for a virus to kill two people of such different age groups simultaneously. Assuming that their exposure to the virus happened at similar times, it would have progressed differently in a 30-year-old woman than it would in an infant. He wonders briefly if it was some kind of food poisoning, but can't think of a poison that causes blockages in your arteries. So the doctor brings out photographs of the car incident, and Ando is like, I don't think this will help, but it would be rude not to at least look at them. So he does, and... Okay, this is going to be really long, but I need to read it out in full. I need to, because I need... I just need you to understand what it is I'm working with here. So settle in, because this is going to be a long one. He flipped through two or three more pictures, laying them on the table like playing cards. There was nothing in them to catch the eye, he thought, but then his hand stopped. He was holding a photo of the car's interior. The camera had been lodged against the passenger side window and aimed so as to take in the front of the cabin. The seatbelt was draped over the driver's seat, and the passenger seat was pushed forward. Ando stared, momentarily unsure of what it was in this picture that had aroused his interest. He'd had the same experience paging absently through books before. Sometimes a word would return to his mind and keep him from turning the pages, but he'd be unable to remember where in the book he'd seen it, or, for that matter, what the word was. His palms started to perspire. He could feel his intuition at work. This photo was trying to tell him something. He brought the picture so close to his face that his nose was almost touching it. He examined every corner of it, then he concentrated his vision on one point, and finally found the thing that had been hiding there. On the passenger seat sat the black thing, mostly hidden because the back of the seat had been pushed forward. A section of the front and one of the sides were the only visible portions. A similar flat black thing rested on the floor of the car, also on the passenger side, held down there by the headrest of the passenger seat. Ando gave a little cry of excitement and called Kurahashi over. Hey, what do you think this thing is? He held the photo out to Kurahashi and indicated where he should look. The short man took off his glasses and looked closely at the photo. Then he shook his head, not so much because he couldn't make out the thing, but because he couldn't figure out why Ando was so interested in it. What is it? Kurahashi muttered without taking his eyes from the photo. It looks to me like a video deck, said Ando, seeking confirmation. That is what it looks like. As soon as he recognized the object for what it was, Kurahashi thrust the photo back at Ando. The object on the passenger seat could just as well have been a candy box given its black rectangular shape, but a close look at the front of the object revealed a round black button. It certainly looked like a video deck. The object on the passenger seat could just as well have been a candy box given its black rectangular shape, but a close look at the front of the object revealed a round black button. It certainly looked like a video deck. It wasn't odd that he'd be carrying around a word processor, but a video deck? All of that. All of that to say, Ando looked at the picture and saw a VCR in the front seat. Like, over one entire page of writing. To say something that could be condensed into one or two sentences. Maybe a full paragraph if you're feeling really spicy. So what I'm getting at here is that Suzuki can be pretty fucking wordy, even when it doesn't serve the story at all. So Ando remembers what Mai told him about Asakawa asking her about a videotape and looks at the license plate on car and realizes that it's a rental. And he's like, why did Asakawa rent a car? Which I think he just didn't own one. Because in Ring, he was always renting cars or taking taxis or the subway. But then Ando moves on and is like, I should probably at least try to talk to Asakawa, even though he knows that Asakawa is basically comatose. Chapter 8 Ando wakes up after having fallen asleep in the taxi on his way to visit Asakawa. 
He feels like somebody is watching him, and he looks around until he spots a snake on the side of the road. This makes him think of the time when he was a child, he threw a rock at a snake and accidentally killed it, and when he went to check on the dead body, he noticed another bigger snake glaring at him, and now that he's grown, he's like, that snake cursed me, and that's why Takenori died. Which, okay. And then he starts crying in the backseat of the taxi, and it was one thing to break down alone in bed, quite another to do it in broad daylight. He wished there was something, anything he could think about that could bring him back to the here and now. Suddenly, he saw Mai Takano's face in his mind. She was working on a fruit parfait with such enthusiasm that he thought she might lick the dish when she was through. The collars of a white blouse peeked out from the neck of her dress. Her left hand rested on her knee. Finished with the parfait, she wiped her lips with a napkin and stood up. He was beginning to see. Sexual fantasies about Mai were the only thing that could draw him out of the abyss of grief. Ando, I am begging you. Just get a hobby like a normal person. Chapter 9. Surprise! It's a chapter from Mai's perspective. She's on her way to visit Ryuji's parents because she needs to find some papers of Ryuji's. See, he was working on a series of articles for, like, a magazine or something, and he had finished but never submitted the final piece in the series before he got smallpoxed in the heart. Mai had offered to clean up the draft and turn it in for publication, but was unable to find the last page and is hoping that it's still somewhere in Ryuji's things. While she's on her way there, she thinks about her relationship with Ryuji and how much better he was than all of the silly boys her own age she dated because he wanted to have conversations with her instead of just having the sex. And Mai was only interested in talking to Ando in the first place because he was a friend of Ryuji's. Mai was still under the sway of the words of a man who'd been dead two weeks. If Ryuji hadn't, men if Ryuji hadn't mentioned Ando to her, she probably never would have been able to call the ME's office to ask about the cause of death. She never would have ended up seeing Ando again on campus. She certainly never would have made plans to have dinner with him. One chance word from Ryuji had subtly bound her. So this Ryuji's words holding sway or binding people into doing certain things is a reoccurring phrase in this book. Like, not only was he this super mega genius, but he was also a master manipulator and his ghost is trying to force events to benefit him in some way which is frustrating. Like I said in my last video, it sucks that the second Ryuji gets properly introduced into the story, he basically just takes it over. And now here he is, being the primary driving force of the story, even after he literally died. And that really sucks. Not just because Ryuji sucks, but because focusing on him pulls the focus away from characterizing other characters who desperately need it like Mai. So Mai is bound by Ryuji's words and also focusing on completing his final work and appears to have no thoughts beyond those that relate to Ryuji in some way. I'm not saying that she shouldn't mourn her boyfriend who died two weeks ago, but mourning her boyfriend is all she does? Mai is very much a sexy lamp character. That is, a character who could be replaced by an inanimate object and very little of the plot would change. Mai isn't a character who has agency and makes choices. She is a character that other characters enjoy looking at, and decisions are made around her. And I know she's not, like, the main character, and doesn't necessarily have to be a driving force in the plot, but she's a point-of-view character now, and she's still just doing what Ryuji tells her to and cleaning up after Ryuji and hanging out with Ryuji's friends, because maybe they can tell her more stories about Ryuji. So she makes it to Ryuji's parents' house, and they show her to Ryuji's old bedroom, where they're storing all of Ryuji's stuff that got brought over after he died. Apparently, they just still had Ryuji's bedroom set up and ready for him, even though he hasn't lived there in over a decade, which... okay... Mai starts going through the books until she feels like someone's watching her, and then she's like, no, I'm being ridiculous, and goes back to looking through the books. But then she has sudden heart palpitations and has to stop again, and she's like, it feels like there's someone else in the room with me. But there isn't, she's alone. And then she notices her jacket on a box and is like, did I put that there? So she picks up her jacket and finds a VCR in that box, and she pulls it out and finds Ryuji's copy of the cursed tape inside and she grabs it and the chapter ends. Chapter 10. Ando gets to the hospital and goes up to see Asakawa. He is, as advertised, completely unresponsive to Ando's questions. The doctors are pretty sure he's still in shock over losing his family the way he did, and Ando gives up and is like, hey, tell me if his condition changes to the doctor who's treating Asakawa and leaves. 
Chapter 11. Another my chapter. This time, Mai has thoughts about something that isn't Ryuji, namely her small apartment. She thinks about how she could probably get a bigger apartment if she were willing to move a bit further away from the university, but she actually really likes being able to reach out and touch all of her walls in the middle of the room, and it has its own bathroom, so it's got everything she really needs. And after that brief respite, we're back to thinking all about Ryuji all the time. Maya's like, wait, what if I just erase the one sentence that makes it sound like he's going to lead into another paragraph and edit the last one to make it sound more conclusive, rather than try and guess whatever it was Ryuji was about to say here. And then she sees the tape that she apparently just stole from Ryuji's room because asking permission seemed too bothersome. The narration is like, I wasn't sure how to broach the subject, so I just didn't, so she decides to watch it. The book spares us from having to listen to the tape being described again, which is nice. Okay, so I know what you're probably thinking. My watch the tape so she gets to be in on the mystery now, right? She was ostensibly Ryuji's student and has taken it upon herself to finish Ryuji's unfinished work, arguably the most important of which would be finding a way to break the curse. So she's going to team up with Ando, who is a medical doctor, and they're going to go and find something that Asakawa and Ryuji overlooked during the last book. Maybe they'll bond over the course of the investigation and Ando will move on from his growing obsession with her. Or more likely they'll be forced into a relationship by author Fiat. But, well. As soon as she'd finished watching it, Mai felt like throwing up. And she ran to the bathroom. She wished she'd turned it off halfway through. But she couldn't resist the power of those images. She'd watched it until the very end. No, it was probably more accurate to say she'd been shown it. She simply couldn't press the stop button. She was drenched with sweat and shivering. She felt something force its way up from her stomach into her throat. She felt more revulsion than fear. Something had come inside her, deep inside her. She knew she had to get it out. She stuck her finger down her throat, but only vomited a small amount. She choked on the taste of bile, and tears streamed from her eyes. Turning a hollow, helpless gaze around the room, she slumped to her knees. For a while, she could feel herself being destroyed. And then her consciousness receded to some place far, far away. That's the last we ever see of Mai. And also the end of part one. Part two, Vanishing, opens with Ando waiting for Mai. It's the day of their big date. He waits for an hour and a half after their appointed meeting time. Remember, this is set in the 90s, so he can't just text her and ask her if she was on her way. Eventually, he gives up and goes to join the farewell party for his co-worker, he meets Miyashita there, and Miyashita's like, Oh, rad, we were just about to move on to the after party. But then he has to go talk to somebody for a bit, and Ando finds a payphone and calls Mai's apartment. But Mai doesn't answer the phone. Miyashita comes back and is like, So the test results came back, because Miyashita's primary role in this story is to move the plot forward. Miyashita reveals that the two teens who died in the car had a virus similar to smallpox. Ando's like, What? That's crazy. And Miyashita's stuck going, yeah, but that's the plot, and that's basically his reaction to every weird thing that happens in this book, and it's delightful. The hotel lobby was filled with the clamor of drunken knots of people. Somewhere in the hullabaloo, he could hear an infant laughing. A baby here at this hour? Ando wondered, checking the couches, but he didn't see any baby. Chapter 2. Ando goes around campus asking Mai's teachers if they've seen her at all. They haven't. He decides to go call Mai's mom to see if she's heard anything from Mai, but Mai's mother also hasn't heard anything from her. Mai's mother isn't especially concerned, because sometimes she and Mai just don't talk for months at a time, and that's normal for them. And Ando's like, your daughter hasn't shown up for class in a week. Do you think you could come over and help me talk her super into letting me into her apartment so I can see if she's okay? And her mom's like, I don't know. And Ando's like, Fine, could you at least call the super and let him know that I'm going over to her apartment and need him to let me in? And she's like, eh, I guess. Which, lady, a little urgency, maybe? Your daughter was in contact with a man who died from what appears to be a new strain of the smallpox virus and hasn't been seen by anybody in over a week now. Anyway, chapter 3 opens with Ando on his way to Mai's apartment. He goes to the super's office and the super is like, Great, I was hoping somebody would come check on her. And Ando's like, K, because he isn't sure what to say to that. As they pass by the mailboxes, Ando notices that Mai's mailbox is full to bursting but doesn't do anything about it. So they go up to Mai's apartment and, without realizing it, Ando took a step back. I should have brought surgical gloves. The virus that had brought about Ryuji's death was probably not airborne. 
He imagined it to be like AIDS, fairly difficult to catch. Still, it was an unknown quantity, and he should have taken precautions. Not that he was all that attached to life, but he didn't want to die just yet. Not until he'd figured out this puzzle. Dang, Ando, even Asakawa was more well-prepared than you. But I really do feel that last line about not being particularly attached to life. As somebody who struggles with depression myself, I understand that sentiment better than I would like. What I'm saying is that this part rings true in a way that the previous book didn't manage. Anyway, Ando heads inside and is relieved when he doesn't immediately happen upon Mai's rotting corpse. But then he's like, but wait, if she's not here, then where is she? So he's looking around at her furniture, by which I mean her table and her futon that she has folded in a corner, and pajamas, neatly folded, lay on the seat with a bra and panties wadded up next to them. Maybe it's just because I'm in a young woman's apartment? Ando was trying to figure out why he felt so uncomfortable. His chest was tight and his pulse was pounding. Seeing her underwear made him wonder if he was just an overexcited voyeur. I mean, yeah, probably. Moving on. Ando continues to look around the apartment until the super is like, okay, are we done? Because the super is just freaked all the way out by the apartment and wants to leave. And Ando's like, yeah, I guess. But then as they head to the elevator, Ando thinks about this one autopsy he did where the woman's organs were still piping hot even though she had already been dead for 12 hours. And honestly, I don't know what the point of that anecdote is, but it's there. Anyway, as they approach the elevator, Ando's like, wait a minute. And asks the super if he can go back in for a sec, and the super is like, just take the keys and go back by yourself because he doesn't want to go back to the spooky apartment. And Ando's like, okay. So he does. He looks around for more stuff that he might have overlooked the first time he was in the room. The decor didn't strike him as particularly feminine, though it certainly wasn't masculine. If it hadn't been for the penguin design on the backrest, he wouldn't have been able to guess the inhabitant's gender. This just in, penguins have been determined to be feminine. Ando seated himself on the backrest and picked up Mai's underwear. He brought them close to his face and sniffed them, then held them away then sniffed them again. They smelled like milk. Takanori's undershirts had smelled that way when he was a toddler. Hey, Ando? What the fuck? I should point out that those two paragraphs I quoted are back-to-back -back with no space in between. It's kind of an insane level of whiplash for me and my jokey jokes. And I guess we should probably talk about this. I don't mind Ando being a weird pervert, in the same way that I mind, say, Mineta from My Hero Academia. And that's for one very important reason. Ando's perversion isn't framed as a good thing. It's pretty clear every time it's brought up that it's an extremely unhealthy way of trying to cope with the loss of his family. He's not like a gross pervert that we're supposed to laugh at. He's a gross pervert that you're supposed to feel sad for, and that's an important distinction. So Ando notices the tape and decides to try and watch it, but the tape has been entirely taped over by somebody else. Aside from the first few seconds, however, his fears had been misplaced. All the tape contained was mundane TV programming. The talk show came to an end and was followed by a rerun of an old samurai adventure. Ando stopped the tape and rewound it. He wanted to examine the weather report segment. He found the beginning of the forecast and pressed play. The woman said, And now here's a look at the weather for Tuesday, November 13th. He pressed pause and the image froze. November 13th? Today was the 15th, which meant that this had been recorded the day before yesterday. But who'd been around to press record? Was Mai here just two mornings ago? So you'd think that Mai watched the video and got so spooked by it that she just taped over the whole thing, right? Well, no, actually, that isn't what happened. We'll get to it when we get to it, but just know that this part doesn't make sense. While Ando is puzzling out the mystery of the tape, he hears water dripping and goes into the bathroom to check it out. He sees that the bath is draining and is like, who pulled the plug? Nobody else is here. And then he touches the water and realizes that it's still warm. Then he hears someone giggling behind him, but he can't see anyone else in the apartment. Then he notices a puddle of brown stuff on the floor and is like, gross, is this vomit? Then he trips over his own two feet, and while he's trying to recover from that, he feels something touch his ankle. This creeps him all the way out, so he panics and runs out of the apartment to the elevator. 
and he gets mad at the elevator for taking a long time, but then he realizes he was so scared he forgot to press the button. Chapter 4 Ando and Miyashita are hanging out in Ando's office. Miyashita is telling him about his findings regarding the smallpox virus, but Ando is so spooked by being touched by a ghost that he isn't listening. And Miyashita's like, are you okay? And Ando's like, yeah, I'm just tired, but Miyashita doesn't buy it. Well, never mind. Just don't keep asking me the same questions over and over. No one likes to be interrupted. Sorry. Now may I go on? Please do. About that virus they discovered in those bodies in Yokohama. The one that's just like smallpox, Ando volunteered. That's the one. So it resembles smallpox visually? Miyashita slapped the table. He flashed Ando a look of exasperation. So you really weren't listening. I just told you. They ran the new virus through a DNA sequencer in order to analyze its bases. Then they ran it through a computer. Turns out it corresponds closely with the library data on smallpox. But they're not identical? No, we're talking maybe a 70% overlap. What about the other 30%? Brace yourself. It's identical to the basal sequence of an enzyme encoding gene. Enzymes of what species? Homo sapiens. You're kidding. I understand it's pretty unbelievable, but it's true. Another specimen of the same virus contained human protein genes. In other words, this new virus is made up of smallpox genes and human genes. I know I've said it before, and I'm probably going to say it again before this video is done, but I love how Miyashita keeps going like, yeah, I know this sounds completely ridiculous, but this is the plot. So they keep talking about it, and it turns out that the virus in Ryuji's blood was different from all the other viruses. Is the virus from Ryuji's body the same? Finally, we come to that. Just the other day, we found a nearly identical virus in a frozen sample of Ryuji's blood. Another smallpox human combo? I said nearly. Okay. It's almost identical, but in one segment, we found a repetition of the same basal sequence. Ando waited for Miyashita to continue, and he did. No matter where we cut it, we kept coming up with a repetition of the same 40-odd bases. Ando didn't know what to make of it. So I don't know enough about viruses to know if this is even remotely how any of this works, or if Suzuki is just, like, using science-sounding words. I guess it doesn't really matter beyond how much I'm able to point and laugh at this nonsense. But while they're contemplating the news that Ryuji's virus is different from all the others, Yoshino calls. Yoshino's in this book. And true to form, I completely forgot about him until he turned up again. Ando agrees to meet him and discuss the recent string of deaths, and once Ando hangs up, he and Miyashita are like, oh man, did someone leak the news of this new virus to the press? This could be really bad. Chapter 5 Yoshino and Ando meet for lunch. Yoshino is initially pretty stressed and looking at his watch a bunch, but then he wanders off to make a phone call and comes back feeling calmer. And Ando's like, ah, he must have cleared up his next appointment to give us a little more time, which I'm not sure why they needed to put that detail in there. It kind of feels like a waste of space, but like, whatever. Once he gets back from his phone call, Yoshino sums up the general idea of the first book, According to Yoshino, the whole thing had started on the night of August 29th at a place called Villa Log Cabin, a property of the South Hakone Pacific Land Resort, located where the Izu Peninsula met the mainland. A mixed-gender group of four young people who stayed the night in the cabin B4 had found a videotape recorded psychically by some woman, a videotape that killed anyone who watched it exactly one week later. What the hell? It sounded like nonsense, no matter how many times Ando went over it in his head. And I really like that Ando is like, that sounds fake, even before he hears the part where the videotape was actually made by the ghost of smallpox. Ando is like, well, have you seen this tape? And Yoshino's like, no, why would I do that? And Ando's like, okay, so why is Asakawa alive when everyone else who watched the tape is dead? And Yoshino's like, well, he's a journalist. And Ando doesn't get it until Yoshino's like, he was writing a story about the deaths. He probably wrote what he did to survive down. And then he mentions how he searched Asakawa's apartment, but wasn't able to locate his word processor, which, for the young people in the audience, was sort of like the middle evolution between a typewriter and the word processing programs we use today. And Ando's like, oh shit, because he knows exactly where the word processor is, but he doesn't want to tell Yoshino because he wants to get to it first. Chapter 6 Ando is at work and flags down one of the police officers who he sees and is like, Hey, what happens to the personal belongings of accident victims? 
and the officer explains that typically they're taken by the department that has jurisdiction and held either until the person the item belongs to or a relative of theirs comes by and claims them. And Ando is like, cool, thanks, and goes off to contact Asakawa's parents to see what they did with the word processor. Asakawa's parents are like, we didn't pick it up ourselves, we asked our oldest son to take care of it, so Ando calls him. Speaking on behalf of the medical examiner's office, he said he'd really like to get his hands on that document, and wondered if he might be allowed to make a copy of it, please and thank you. See, Suzuki, you can be concise when you try. Junichiro, Asakawa's brother, is like, I didn't see any documents, and the word processor is pretty much busted from the crash. And Nando's like, that's fine, is there a floppy disk inside? Do you guys remember floppy disks? Anyway, Junichiro is like, yeah, you can come over and get it tomorrow if you really want it. And Nando's like, what about the VCR? But Junichiro threw it and the tape inside away, and for some reason Nando's like, I really wanted to see that videotape. But regardless, he goes over to Junichiro's place the next day, and Junichiro lets him look at the word processor. The label hadn't been affixed, so there was no title to be seen. But Ando knew immediately that this was what he'd been searching for. It had sounded right popping out of the slot. Ando promises to return it and heads home. Chapter 7 The next day, Ando heads to visit Miyashita to let him know what he managed to find. Miyashita is already chatting with another one of their co-workers. Everyone keeps telling us we look alike, Nemeto. I'm telling you, it's getting to be such a pain in the butt. Why don't you go on a diet? Miyashita elbowed the younger man's paunch. Well, if I go on a diet, you have to go on one too. Then we'll be right back to where we started. This exchange just made me smile. Moments like this were sorely missing from the previous book. It's part of the reason that I like Spiral so much more than Ring, even though the plot of Spiral is so much weaker. They stop their comedy routine long enough to move the plot forward and give the audience a biology lesson, which, I'm not going to lie, my whole brain just kind of groaned when I started reading this part. It's just like a dry retelling of a thing I learned about in high school over a decade ago. And there are like charts in this book telling which combinations of proteins correspond to which amino acids and is this going to be on the test? Miyashita changes the subject and is like, what did you come over here for anyway? And Nando's like, shit, right, the floppy. And he explains that he has the floppy disk, but he lacks a machine that can read it, and Nemeto's like, and Nemeto's like, oh yeah, there's a new guy in the office who has a word processor that will probably work with that. Why don't you go ask him? Chapter 8. Yeah, that last one was real riveting, let me tell you. Anyway, chapter 8. They walk to the new guy's office to borrow the word processor. Ando doesn't tell them what he thinks might be on the floppy disk and decides that it's probably fine since neither Miyashita nor Nemeto asks. They get to the guy's office and the new guy's like, yeah, you can borrow it if you want. And Ando asks if he can check to make sure the floppy fits. And so he does and he discovers that all of the files on the copy are titled Ring. And that's spooky because it's the word he got from the code Ryuji sent him in the autopsy room. And that's the chapter. It's two pages long. Chapter 9 opens with Hondo at his apartment. He didn't think he could justify printing out hundreds of pages of Word documents at work, so he had to go home to do it. Each page was single-spaced, but still Hondo was able to read faster than the printer could spit them out. Wanting a hard copy, he decided to print it all out instead of reading it on the screen. Now he found himself getting frustrated by the two or three minutes it took each page to be printed. The scariest part of this book is how it reminds us how shitty printers were in the 90s. Can you imagine it taking two or three whole minutes to print one page of text? Terrifying. So this chapter and the next two are basically just a recap of what happened in the last book, which I covered in my last video and don't feel like summarizing it again. I do want to point out this one passage, though. In the middle of the black screen, a pinpoint of light began to flicker. It gradually expanded, jumping around to the left and right, before finally coming to rest on the left-hand side. Then it branched out, becoming a frayed bundle of lights crawling around like worms, which is an excerpt taken from the report that Asakawa wrote, but also a direct quote from Ring, the real-life book, which implies that Ring is supposed to have been written either in whole or in part by Asakawa himself, which will make a couple of later chapters extremely funny. Just wait until we get there. 
Chapter 10. Ando is still reading the summary of Ring. Nothing new is learned. Chapter 11. Ando finally gets to the end of the report. He glanced back at the word processor, only to find a mostly blank sheet of paper staring back at him. He picked up the final page. It said, Sunday, October 21st. The nature of a virus is to reproduce itself. The charm? Make a copy of the video. So Ando recaps the last chapter of Ring and is like, Ah, I see. After he found out Ryuji died, Asakawa had to figure out the way to break the curse. He figured it out. Good for him. But he didn't. If you'll recall, Ryuji's ghost telepathically told Asakawa the answer because Asakawa couldn't do anything right. I guess Asakawa just left that part out of the report for some reason. There's also this line in the summary. Just before her death, Sadako Yamamura had physical relations with the last smallpox victim in Japan, Jotaro Nagao, which is one way to describe what happened. He goes on to be like, I get it, Smallpox was really mad about vaccination, so it, quote, borrowed Sadako's extraordinary power to accomplish the purpose of its existence, to reproduce itself. Which, so they go back and forth a bunch in this book, and the last book. It's either Smallpox borrowed Sadako's power, or Sadako made, like, a pact with the ghost of Smallpox, and was the real antagonist all along. And I guess you can justify it by saying that the characters are all just speculating. But since the rest of the speculation these characters do is framed as just straight-up exposition, it makes the primary source of the conflict in these books, the reason the cursed videotape exists and kills people, really inconsistent. Anyway, Ando is at the end of the report and is like, but do I really believe all this? It sounds far-fetched, but I have seen some evidence suggesting that it might be true. I just don't know. And that's the end of the chapter. It was also like three pages long. Chapter 12, we're finally done going over what happened in the last book. So I guess if you skipped out on reading Ring, you could just read Spiral and get the gist of the plot while missing out on most of the more objectionable parts of the first book. By which I mean Ryuji's spoken lines. So I guess that is also an option you could take. The chapter opens with Ando going to Miyashita like, hey, read this. And Miyashita's like, I didn't know you were a writer. But Ando's like, no, dummy, Asakawa wrote it. Then Miyashita is like, hey, you're good at code, solve this code. And the code in question is the repeating string of bases from the virus in Ryuji's blood sample that wasn't in the samples taken from any of the other victims. And Miyashita, who I remind you is the one whose job it is to push the plot forward and then say, I know it's dumb, but this is the plot, shut up and do it, is like, it's a code. Solve it, dummy. And to the book's credit, it does give you all the clues you need to solve the code on your own. I didn't bother because, like, effort. But somebody who was so inclined could have, and I think that's a good thing that more books should do. Anyway, Ando is like, oh yeah, smart guy, if it's a code, who sent it? And Miyashi is like, I don't know, Ryuji, probably. Ryuji's dead. I performed the autopsy myself. Miyashita didn't seem phased in the least. Well, whatever. Just see if you can decipher this, okay? And that's the end of part two. Part three, decoding, is mostly about solving the code that Ryuji's ghost left them in his DNA. So this part is going to be a little bit shorter than the others, because Ando spends, like, two straight chapters solving the code in detail, and my telling you about it would be way less interesting than you just reading it for yourself. But first, chapter one opens with Ando and Miyashita eating lunch together after Miyashita finished reading the report Asakawa wrote. Ando fills Miyashita in on how there was a VCR in the car when Asakawa crashed, so presumably Asakawa had his wife and kid make copies as well, but they both died anyway, and Miyashita's like, it's a shame the video was gone, I would have liked to have watched it. And then they talk about AIDS again, and discuss how a videotape can kill you anyway, because that doesn't seem physically possible. Me? I think it involves the mind. Miyashita leaned forward until his nose almost touched Ando's. It was, of course, common knowledge that the mind, as abstract and immaterial as it was, could influence the body in various ways. Ando was well aware of this. One only had to think of how stress could eat holes in the stomach lining. Now, Ando and Miyashita were thinking along the same lines. First, the video created in the viewer a particular psychological state that somehow influenced the viewer's own DNA to metamorphose until the mystery virus which resembled smallpox was born. So I think you can see why I enjoy reading this book so much. The video... it... <laughs> The video was so upsetting, it caused the viewer's very DNA to try and kill them. It's 
just so deliciously unhinged that I can't not love it. Anyway, chapter two. Ando calls a coroner from around where Shizu's parents live and asks him if he's had any smallpox cases. The other Emmy is like, whoa, yeah, how'd you know? Because between the simultaneous deaths and the note they left, we assumed it was a double suicide, but it turns out it was smallpox. And Ando is like, wait, what was that about a note? So the other Emmy faxes over the note that Shizu's parents left before they died. October 28th, morning. We took it upon ourselves to dispose of the videotapes. There's nothing more to worry about. We're tired. Yoshimi and Kazuko, please take care of everything. Toru Oda, let's go Oda. So that was nice of them. Ando assumes that they heard about Shizu and Yoko and decided to just go quietly into that good night. But my read on the situation was a little different. It felt a lot more like, this curse dies with me, than... Guess I'll die. But who am I to argue with the literal text? So Ando goes back to speculating about how the charm works, or if it even works at all. He floats the idea that the charm at the end of the video was a lie and it'll kill you regardless, but shoots that down. If the videotape killed everybody who watched it regardless of whether or not they copied it, it was obvious that it was going to go extinct sooner or later. Only by virtue of its threat would it be able to reproduce itself, to adapt to its environment and survive. Once the only way out was exposed as a lie, the tape would inevitably be driven into a corner. Chapters 3 and 4 Ando goes to the library and solves the code. The answer is mutation. I enjoyed reading these chapters because they were like step-by-step -step feeding you hints on how to solve it for yourself. And to be clear, Suzuki did go out of his way to give the reader everything they needed to solve the code on their own. He even provided those little charts that showed what groups of bases made what proteins, which was instrumental to figuring out the code, so I guess it was on the test. Credit where credit is due, that was really cool, and I wish more books came with fun puzzles to solve in them. There just isn't a lot for me to comment on or make jokes about in these chapters, so we're going to move on. Okay, there are a couple of lines from chapter 3 that I want to share because I think they're extremely funny, but after that we're moving on. What if that DNA had inherited Ryuji's will? and was trying to express itself in words. And, theoretically, it was possible to take DNA from Ryuji's blood sample and use it to make an individual exactly like Ryuji, a clone. Ando man, don't speak that evil into the world. Okay, chapter 5. Ando finds a payphone and calls Miyashita to tell him the good news. Miyashita is like, hell yeah, let's get beers. And Ando is hesitant at first because he can hear Miyashita's kid in the background and doesn't want to interrupt the time Miyashita could be spending with his family. But Miyashita is like, it's cool, just call me when you're in the area. So Ando agrees and heads to the train station, but while he's waiting, he notices that he can see Mai's apartment building from where he's standing, and he sees the curtains in her apartment blowing in the wind, which is extremely weird because he knows for a fact that that window was closed when he left her apartment several chapters ago. So he decides to go check it out, thinking maybe Mai came home and just ghosted him or something. So he gets up to the apartment and knocks, but nobody answers and Ando gets extremely spooked and decides to retreat. As he's waiting for the elevator, Mai's door opens and a woman who isn't Mai walks out and frightens Ando so badly he tries to hit the door close button on the elevator, but he fat fingers the open button instead. The lady doesn't seem to notice Ando at all and just gets into the elevator and they ride it down to the ground floor and she gets out without incident. Chapter 6. Ando is waiting for Miyashita, who had to borrow his wife's bike to come meet with him. Miyashita is very excited because he gets to move the plot along again. I think I might know what mutation might mean. That explained why Miyashita had come on a bike. He was dying to tell Ando his ideas. What does it mean? Let's have a beer first. Which, when we get to the big reveal, you'll realize that this is the correct response to that part of the book. The whole what does mutation mean seems silly to me, because you know, I speak English good. I know what that word means and that mutating is a thing that viruses do. I'm not like a scientist, so I couldn't tell you why they do that, but I do remember enough from my high school biology class to go, oh no, yeah, I get that, without needing a whole chapter explaining it to me. And this is probably a consequence of the book being translated. The narration specifies that the word mutation is in English, so the mystery of what Ryuji might have meant by mutation is probably a lot more mysterious in the original Japanese, because the Japanese audience might not be familiar with this relatively uncommon English word. 
Like, if the plot centered around a French word that I might have heard once or twice when taking French classes in high school, I probably would need an entire chapter explaining what it means and why it's relevant. There probably wasn't an elegant way to translate this part without putting in the work to completely redo the code section to make it into a foreign word that English speakers may not be familiar with, and that would be a lot of effort for very little payoff, so I don't blame them for not doing that. I just think it's a little funny that these two doctors who are very familiar with how viruses work are going, what does mutation mean? In a similar way to how I think translator's note, kekaku means plan, is very funny. Which is to say, this chapter is Miyashita explaining why the charm Ryuji passed along to Asakawa in the last book didn't work, because the virus that is the videotape mutated when the shitty teens taped over a part of it. There are diagrams, just in case you don't understand with words alone. And Andra's like, but all the existing copies of the tape have been destroyed, so we don't have to worry about this anymore. And Miyashita's like, were you not paying attention to my diagrams? You're right. The videotape is extinct, but that's the old strain. The beads of sweat on Miyashita's face grew larger with every swallow of beer he took. What do you mean old? asked Ando. The video mutated. Through copying, it evolved until a new strain emerged. It's still lurking out there somewhere, and it's taken a completely different form. That's what I think, anyway. Miyashita's like, do you really think Ryuji would have gone through all the trouble of changing his DNA to send a message if the videotapes were all destroyed and were not even 200 pages into this book? Why is Asukawa still alive? Ando asked Miyashita the same thing he'd asked him the day before. That's the question, isn't it? He's the only clue as to what that videotape has turned into. Well, actually, there is one other person. Ando gave Miyashita a brief rundown on Mai, how the video had made its way through Ryuji to her, how there was evidence that she'd watched it, and how she'd been missing for nearly three weeks now. I had thought Miyashita already knew the deal with Mai, but I guess not. I hope she's alive. Why? What kind of a question is that, Ando? Part 4 is called Evolving. See, I told you Part 3 wasn't very long. Chapter 1 opens with Miyashita having just finished an autopsy on a young drowning victim. He's talking to the father of the young boy, but this and the obvious parallels with Ando's own trauma are shockingly ignored, and it's cut short when the body of an unidentified female comes in. Ando overhears the Emmy and a police officer discussing where the body was found and realizes that she was found on the rooftop of a building that wasn't too far from where Mai lived, so he decides to insert himself into the investigation to see if it's really Mai's body they found. He talks to the police officer and finds out that the victim was trapped inside an exhaust shaft on the top of a building and wasn't wearing any panties. Chapter 2 Ando goes into the examination room, and Mai's body is lying on the table. The other Emmy is like, oh damn, sorry dude, when he realizes that Ando knew the victim, and Ando gives the police officer the contact information for Mai's mother. He decides not to sit through the autopsy itself, and that's the end of the chapter. It is literally one page, front and back. The other Emmy has a name, but the next chapter is literally the last time he'll ever appear in this book, so don't worry about remembering it. Chapter 3. Ando is not doing paperwork when the other M.E. comes over and is like, so I finished the autopsy. And Ando is like, cliff notes please. And it turns out that Mai didn't die from a heart attack but from exposure from being trapped up in that well for days and days. And the other M.E. is like, so she gave birth shortly before she died. And Ando is like, that doesn't make sense. She wasn't pregnant when I saw her last month. But the other M.E. gives him the autopsy report like, you can read it if you don't believe me. And Suzuki, not content with spending four chapters summarizing his previous book, spends several paragraphs summarizing the very first chapter of this book. But Ando didn't buy it, leaving aside the fact that even allowing for individual variation, she just hadn't looked pregnant. He couldn't forget the impression their first encounter had made on him. He'd first laid eyes on Mai right in the same office, just before he was to dissect Ryuji. She'd been escorted in by a detective who wanted her to tell Ando all she knew about the circumstances of Ryuji's death. She had tried to sit down, then lost balance and steadied herself with a hand on a nearby desk. Ando had known at a glance that she was anemic. He had picked up on the faint scent of blood on her and deduced that her anemia was due to her menstruating. His conclusion had been bolstered by her embarrassed expression as she apologized. Sorry, it's just that... Their eyes had met and they'd had a moment of nonverbal communication. 
please don't worry. It's just the monthly thing. Gotcha. And I guess it's good that he did, because I legit forgot that this had happened. So I went back and checked, and yep, this happened. I guess I, <laughs> I, guess I was just so thrown by the whole I want to touch her organs line that I completely forgot about my being on her period. Anyway, I didn't mention it until now because that's truer to the experience I had while reading the book. So Ando asks if he can have a sample of Mai's blood to test for smallpox. Chapter 4. We find out that Asakawa, the protagonist of the previous book, has died off screen. Ando decides to go bring flowers to where they found Mai's body to pay his respects. While he's there, he looks around to try and figure out why Mai had gone up to the roof in the first place. While he's up on the roof, he sees the woman who was in Mai's apartment, and she's like, hey, haven't I seen you before? And Ando doesn't answer her question at all, and is like, are you my sister? She doesn't say anything, but Ando decides that that must be true, and feels silly for being so afraid of her before. So Ando decides that he's done with being on the roof and starts to head down to the street. I'll call on you soon with a request. She had said this just before the door closed. Ando had heard her clearly, and there was no mistaking her words. The doors, as they closed, were like a camera shutter, removing her from his field of vision, but leaving her image imprinted on Ando's brain. As the elevator descended slowly, Ando found himself overcome with an uncontrollable lust. Mai had been the object of the first sexual fantasies he'd had since his family had ceased to be, but this was far more intense. Ando, you need to calm down. <laughs> he ought to have waited for her to come down from the roof, but he hadn't. Or rather, he couldn't. It was as though his every movement were being controlled by that woman. He had acted against his will. So chapter 5 takes place a week after Mai's autopsy. Ando heads over to meet Miyashita in the meadow, who was that guy who did the comedy act with Miyashita way back in part 2. And they all look at the blood samples from the very smallpox victims under an electron microscope. And this book has illustrations in it, which I find very charming. So, because Ando and Miyashita discovered the novel virus, they get to be the ones to name it, and Miyashita suggests ring, because under the microscope the virus looks kind of like an engagement ring, like it's round at the bottom with a kind of diamond-shaped head at the top. Miyashita wanted Ando's opinion. The name was perfect, but Ando felt uneasy for precisely that reason. It was too perfect, and made him wonder if the godlike being were making itself felt. How did all this begin? Ando had no trouble remembering. And then Ando goes on to remind us of all of the other things that said ring in this book, namely the code from Ryuji's stomach and what Asakawa named his word documents. So Suzuki hasn't managed to shake his habit of reminding his reader about his very important and smart plot at every available opportunity. At least he's reminding us of things that happened at least 50 pages ago, rather than just reiterating what we learned in the previous chapter. And admittedly, I did legitimately find the reminder that Mai was on her period helpful because I had completely forgotten. So they swap to Mai's blood sample, and instead of being ring-shaped, the virus in her blood is sperm-shaped, but all the men in the room are too embarrassed to say so. The result was a shape that Ando, Miyashita, and Nemeto were all quite familiar with. All three men were reminded of the same thing at the same time, but no one dared say it. Chapter 6 Ando and Miyashita discuss what they discovered in the previous chapter, but unlike in Ring, I don't mind this repetition because I don't loathe the two characters involved. I mean, Ando is a lot, but not in a way that makes me hate him in the way that Ryuji and Asakawa did. Basically, they established that Asakawa and Mai, the two people who weren't killed by heart attacks, had more sperm-shaped cells than ring-shaped ones, and that they need to establish what those two did differently than the others. They also talk about how the growth rate of the video copying would have been pretty slow compared to regular viruses, and who knows, maybe the mutation made it harmless rather than more deadly. Miyashita's an optimist. And Nando's like, wait, shit, I forgot to track down when Mai came into contact with the tape. Chapter 7 Ando calls Ryuji's mom and manages to figure out the date that Mai would have likely obtained the tape, the day that she went over to try and find Ryuji's missing page. Since Mai made contact with Ryuji's editor between the time she got the tape and the day she died, Ando decides to go talk to the editor to see if he noticed anything strange about her. The editor mentions that Mai had seemed queasy on the day that they met, but she said that it was because she had pulled an all-nighter trying to finish the manuscript up for him. He chose not to question it further, but definitely didn't notice that she was suddenly pregnant. 
Ando thanks him and leaves. On his way out, he runs into Asakawa's older brother who gives him the cold shoulder. Ando is confused because he didn't think he did anything to offend him, but decides that a stranger not liking him probably isn't his biggest concern. Chapter 8. Ando goes home and thinks about the virus for a little while. He counts on a calendar to realize that Mai was ovulating on the day that she watched the video. And since those broken rings look a whole lot like sperm, the virus must have fertilized her egg and she gave birth to whatever it created a week later and then died. But Asakawa wasn't ovulating the day that he watched the tape, so Ando isn't quite sure what he did that saved him, because apparently it wasn't actually making a copy of the tape, that was all a fake trick from the end of the last book, so even Asakawa's extremely tiny deduction thanks to Ryuji's telepathic hints weren't enough to save him. Part 5. Foreshadowing. Part 5 opens with Miyashita stopping by Ando's place like, get in the car, loser, we're going on a trip. While they're driving, Miyashita talks about a trip he took with his family to a village that was the setting of a book he liked. I know it's insensitive to say this to you, but family is a really wonderful thing. We could hear the surf from that inn sea, and it woke me up in the middle of the night. And as I gazed at the faces of my wife and daughter, it sank in just how dear they are to me. I've said it before. But I really love these human moments that the characters have in this book. Miyashita talks about how he was being too cavalier about the virus before, and after the trip with his family he realized just how important they are to him, and how much danger he could have put himself in by getting involved. And it's really refreshing after dealing with Asakawa and Ryuji the whole last book to be following two people who genuinely like each other, and act nice towards each other, and love their families. You know, as opposed to Ryuji and Asakawa, who spent their entire time either barely tolerating each other or condescending to each other. Of course, Suzuki immediately undercuts this really good scene with the rest of this chapter. So Miyashita mentions the fact they went to a village that was the setting of a book he liked to make the following point. No matter how good the descriptions in the book were, they couldn't quite convey the exact scenery. So he takes Ando to the cabin from Ring, and everything looks exactly like they pictured in their minds when they read the report. Now when I said that the prose in the last book was pretty good, I didn't mean that it was that good. Chapter 2. They actually go inside the cabin and find it looks exactly like they pictured it. So they decide to drive over and visit Nagao from the first book, you remember the guy who murdered Sadako? So they go to his office and it's been closed down for months. They track him down and he's just basically catatonic in a wheelchair. You know, because he just feels so guilty about those crimes he committed 50 years ago that he didn't care about until Ryuji came to yell at him about it. After confirming that Nagao looks basically exactly like they imagined he would, they decide to go back to Tokyo. While they're driving, Ando and Miyashita discuss getting tested for the ring virus. Ando convinces Miyashita to just drop him off at the first train station they see so that Miyashita can go straight home instead of driving so far out of his way. While he's waiting for the train, Ando begins to compare himself and Miyashita to Asakawa and Ryuji. He worries that he might actually be ring positive, but convinces himself that it's fine because he has nothing left to live for anyway. Chapter 3. Ando falls asleep on the train and misses his stop. So he gets off the train and takes it back the other way to the station he usually stops at, and finds that woman who definitely isn't my sister waiting for him. She'd been lying in wait for him, but it was no use resisting her charms now that she stood before him. Together they went through the ticket gate and turned into the little store line street beyond. Chapter 4. Ando wakes up the next morning next to the strange woman. She had, between chapters, introduced herself as Masako, and also, he'd ejaculated three times that he could remember. Not that this gave him any particular pride about his virility. He was about to turn 35, and his managing to do it three times, at least, in one night said more about her beauty than his stamina. I know, but if I had to read those words with my own two eyeballs, then you all had to hear me read them out loud, because that is the deal we made. Anyway, Ando takes Masako to the movies, and it's a new release, but Masako is able to recite the dialogue as it's being spoken, despite never having seen the movie before and it also being a foreign film with Japanese subtitles. So after the movie, she's like, burgers and ice cream! And Ando is like, okay, and they go off to eat those, but the ice cream melts and drips all over her legs, so she licks it off her stockings because... I don't know... Remember when this was like a medical mystery horror story? Masako drags Ando off to a bookstore and he finds a pamphlet about upcoming releases and Masako decides that actually she wants to watch another movie and drags him out of the store. 
Chapter 5. Ando and Masako go back to his place again and Ando hears the phone ringing. Masako wanders off screen for a little bit while Ando has the important plot discussion with Miyashita who's like, what the fuck dude, did you forget what book you're in? So while Ando was on his little date, Miyashita had gone to the theater troupe where Sadako used to work and managed to get a hold of the headshots that they had on file for her. He says something about how they didn't look like he expected, which was weird because everything else was like one-to-one. And then he's like, but I have this friend who's good at doing portraits, and he says that self-portraits are the hardest for him to do because he can't get his features right. And Ando is like, what does that have to do with anything? And Miyashita's like, I don't actually know. That was just in the script. Didn't you get your copy? So Miyashita faxes over a copy of the pictures, and while he's waiting for the fax to come through, Ando looks through the pamphlet. And he realizes that Asakawa's brother had edited the ring report that Asakawa wrote to make it into a novel, and it was going to be released to the general public, and Nando was like, oh no, that can't happen. But before he can do anything about it, the fax comes through, and he screamed. The woman in the photos was indeed different from what he'd imagined, but that wasn't why he screamed. The photos on the fax were of the woman standing in front of him now. She took the fax out of his hands and looked at the photos. Ando stared up at her weakly, like a boy getting a scolding from his mother. Finally, he managed to bring the words to his throat. You're Sadako Yamamura. Not Masako. Not my sister. Those were lies. Shock and surprise. So, I'm sure we all saw this coming, but the how of it is just so much better than you think it's going to be. You're just going to have to wait until we get there. It's going to be a little while yet because Ando faints and the chapter ends. Chapter 6. Ando wakes up and justifies his fainting to himself like, You know what? I just found out that I fucked a ghost. I'm allowed. So Sadako gets out of the shower and Ando's like, Wait a second. But I definitely would have noticed if she had testicles when I was doing the sex with her. Because remember, Sadako was intersex. Sadako makes no move to stop him as he decides to abandon ship and make a break for the door. Chapter 7. Ando realizes there is a dummy when he stops running because he abandoned his jacket and his wallet and is now cold and broke. The only money he has on him is 5,000 yen or around 50 bucks. So he hops on a train and heads to Miyashita's house. Ando decides to do his best Asakawa impression and asks Miyashita to just explain the plot to him because he just fucked a ghost and he can't deal with any more of this nonsense. The evil video was born from Sadako's mind. Mai watched it on a day when she was ovulating. The ring virus was born in her body and then fertilized her egg. Fertilized isn't the right word, though. It's probably more accurate to say that the nucleus of Mai's egg was replaced with Sadako Yamamura's genes. So, (laughs) so, so, if somebody watches the video, or now thanks to Asakawa, reads ring, when they're ovulating... They instantly become pregnant with a clone of Sa- <laughs> with a clone of Sadako that ge- and gives birth to that clone a week later. It's just it's so beautiful in its absurdity. It's only going to get better from here. Although the chapter does make sure to bring my mood down by reminding me that Sadako was nineteen when she died. So hey, Ando. How did the 19-year-old girl convince you that she was older than the 22-year-old you spent the whole book lusting after? I guess it's kind of implied that Sadako was using her psychic powers to influence Ando, which is also very bad. I wonder if Suzuki really thought out the implications of what he was writing, because fucking yikes. Moving right along. (laughs) I forgot how good this is going to be. Okay, focus. Just as the ring virus had invaded Mai's body and headed for her womb, in Kazuyuki's body, the virus had... (laughs) In Kazuyuki's body, the virus had headed for his brain. It wasn't really Kazuyuki Asakawa who wrote Ring. He had been forced to write it. Sadako's DNA entered his brain to make him do it. (laughs) (laughs) Sadako's DNA entered his brain and made him do it. And that was how he was able to describe things with such video camera-like accuracy. Only his depiction of Sadako, the main subject, verisimilitude. According to the logic that dictated that the person looking through the viewfinder won't appear on film. Now there's a lot of good stuff in that paragraph. I'm particularly partial to the idea that Sadako's DNA (laughs) made Asako. 
the idea that Sadako's DNA made Asakawa right ring. I also think that's the first time Asakawa has been called by his first name in the entire series so far, which is kind of weird and I don't think it ever happens again either. Miyashita wonders why Sadako sought Ando out in the first place and they decide to head back to Ando's apartment. Chapter 8 Sadako is long gone and left a letter that comprises most of this chapter. Miyashita reads it aloud to Ando. It details how she was reborn when Mai watched the videotape, and that even when she was still inside Mai, she could see through Mai's eyes and basically pilot her around like a mech suit, which is extremely funny to me. So, the day she was born, she piloted Mai up to the roof because she wanted Mai's body to be left somewhere it would take a really long time to be found so that she could live in Mai's apartment in the meantime. And once she was down there, Sadako realized how similar the moments of her birth and death were, being trapped down in that dark hole, but this time she was able to climb out and went to hang out at Mai's place until she aged up to 19, which took about a week. And now we're getting to what I think might be the silliest part of this book. Deep within my body, however, there was one way in which I could tell I was different from my previous self. Intuition is all I have to go by regarding the changes in my body, but I know beyond a doubt that I am different from what I was before. I seem to have both a womb and testicles. Previously, I had no womb. Reborn, I have both, and am now a complete hermaphrodite. What is more, the man in me can ejaculate. I learned that as a result of what we did together. Now, I'm given to understand that the accepted term for intersex people is intersex and not hermaphrodite. Although apparently doctors were debating replacing the word hermaphrodite with intersex as early as the 1940s, so that's not the point. The point is that s <laughs> the point is that Sadako can now fertilize her own eggs and give birth to clones to herself, and that's and it's gonna get better, just you wait. So Miyashita keeps reading, and Sadako basically threatens them like, you guys are Red Ring, and now I can kill you with my psychic powers at any time, so don't try to get in my way, but, but also, if you do this for me, I'll do something nice for you. But they don't specify what it is for some reason, I guess drama. Basically, Sadako is offering to revive Takanori in exchange for Ando not trying to stop Ring from being published. And Miyashita tells him to go for it, and I was like, but wait, what about the fate of humanity? And Miyashita's like, oh, don't act so high and mighty. Look, we can refuse and die, and her plan will go forward anyway. Or we can agree, and we can both live, and you can get your son back. And Ando's like, that doesn't seem fair. What are you getting out of this? And Miyashita's like, I get to be alive, man. And who knows, maybe I can hit Sadako up for a favor somewhere down the road. And I'm just like, holy shit, wait a minute, this is all Ryuji's fault. And it turns out that Ryuji was the real villain who orchestrated all of this as a ghost so Sadako would bring him back to life. Epilogue! And Miyashita's like, I get to be alive, man. And who knows, maybe I can hit Sadako up for a favor somewhere down the road. And I'm just like, holy shit, wait a minute, this is all Ryuji's fault. And it turns out that Ryuji was the real villain who orchestrated all of this as a ghost so Sadako would bring him back to life. Epilogue. So Ando breaks down the process by which Sadako uses her uterus to 3D print clones of dead people, namely Takanori and Ryuji. The first thing to do was for Sadako to inseminate one of her own eggs. With both female and male functions, Sadako was the only one capable of implanting a fertilized egg in her uterine wall with no outside assistance. The next step was to remove this egg and replace its DNA with the DNA of the individual they wanted to bring back to life. True, it took delicate skill to extract the nucleus from one of the cells in Takanori's hair and switch it with the nucleus of Sadako's inseminated egg, but for a specialist, it wasn't all that difficult. Theoretically, it was possible even to resurrect long-extinct dinosaurs, as long as their DNA survived, and oh my god, can we please get that book next? And Ando is like, why are you even here to Ryuji, which is how I react when Ryuji shows up. And Ryuji's like, I just came to twirl my mustache. Ryuji brags about how Ring has sold a million copies, which by the time Spiral was published, it had in real life, and how it was going to be made into a movie, which again, it also was about to be made into a movie in real life. 
Anyway, Ryuji fucks off and Ando takes Takanori into the ocean, and that's the end of the book. So Spiral is a real two steps forward, one step back sort of sequel, in my opinion. I liked Ando and Miyashita way more than I liked Asakawa and Ryuji. They were a lot more pleasant to spend time with, and Ando's grief made him a way more compelling character to follow. But the overall plot felt way less focused than Ring did. A lot of the chapters in the book didn't really feel like they had anything to do with each other, and not to mention that stretch of, what, three or four chapters right in the middle where we just did Ring again, and then a second time when they went to go hang out at the cabin and visit Nagao just cuz... I don't know how these books were published in the original Japanese, but going from the way it reads, it kind of feels like they were published serially. Like each part was published individually and a week or more apart from each other, which might explain the constant repetition. And the whole, you know, Ryuji manipulated everything from beyond the grave part, that, that just sucked a lot. And not just because I hate Ryuji. It makes his character so inconsistent. Like, in the last book, Suzuki bent over backwards to promise that no, Ryuji actually really was a good guy, and all of his shittiness was just him playing a part around his friend Asakawa, or whatever. But in this one, now it's like, no, actually, the part about how Ryuji's crimes were all lies? That was actually all lies. Ryuji is just a monster who sacrificed Mai, the woman he claimed to love, so that he could be alive again. And Sadako being reborn because Mai was ovulating when she watched the videotape, and being able to clone p people with her magic uterus is just... I mean, it kind of stretched my suspension of disbelief past the breaking point. But you know, I've read other people's reviews on this book and they seem to like the twist? I don't understand. Anyway, Spiral is probably the weakest of the three books in the series I've read. Loop is... Well, we'll get to Loop next video. Let's just say that if Spiral is where the series goes off the rails, Loop is where the train grows wings and flies away. Alright, now it's time for me to ask you to do the YouTube things. You know, press the like button if you liked the video, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more of these videos. Also, press the bell button. I'm not sure what the bell does, but press it. Let's find out together. Also, also, I do have a Patreon. The link is in the description, so if you really like the video, feel free to go and become a patron. You'll be able to see these videos early, as well as the finished pages of the comic I'm working on. And some other stuff. Okay, bye!